possibly you may be facing uh, with uh, coatings in the industry right now. So first of all, a little bit of uh, an introduction. I've been involved in electronics manufacturing all of my working life, originally with GEC Marconi, making printed circuit boards, the bare boards, assembly, and soldering. And uh, also I've been involved in environmental testing, failure analysis, those are the activities. And then I set up my own training co and consultancy company, which I've run um, for over 25 years now. So this is just a little bit about my background and where I've been involved or what I've been involved in. Now, if you're interested in uh, inspection and quality control standards, then um, they exist in the industry. And, uh, but there's no reason why you can't augment your own standards into existing IPC standards. Remember that IPC standards or any other documents are a guide and wherever possible it's better to have photographs which illustrate your own boards, your own assemblies and perhaps your own issues. So it's just something to think about for the future. Now why conformally coat? Well some of the reasons for conformally coating prevent premature failure of a product. Um, it really does give protection to the printed circuit board in different environments. It also potentially can improve the performance on specific components and locations um, and designers will know this all too well. It improves the environmental protection without putting the product into a sealed box but of course a sealed enclosure is perfectly feasible. The advantage uh, may be that uh, coating the printed circuit board is cheaper than putting it in a sealed box. It very much depends on your own product. Now with some conformal coatings it does give some mechanical support to components and with it obviously the solder joints. However, the material you select and choose must meet the requirements of your product and also mustn't put any stress directly on the components on the printed circuit board assembly. One of the things to bear in mind, you should never use a conformal coating uh, to solve a specific problem unless you know what the problem actually is. One of the things that sometimes happens is you have a problem with a board assembly, uh, possibly dendrite formation, corrosion, and the quick gut feel is you use conformal coating which can, in some instances, actually exaggerate the problem. So find the cause of the problem before you implement a coating into your process. Now, if you review the IPC standards, um, there are some designators which are used, uh, abbreviations really, to the types of coatings which are used in the industry. And I've listed them here. I've given you a rough estimation of the general thicknesses used for those specific coatings, um, both in thousands of an inch or American mills or microns, and that gives you a guide. It's not that's what you need, it is a guide to the material and the material capability. You have to decide what coating thickness you need for your own specific product and the problem you're trying to solve, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Now in terms of material, additional material which is out there in the industry, there is of course specifications and I've mentioned IPC, there are three IPC documents which you should be familiar with. Um, James Lacari wrote a book quite a few years ago now, um, Coating Materials for Electronic Applications, that's pretty useful and there's some good material in there which is still relevant today. However, there is a newer textbook out, and I'll mention that in a second. In addition, there's NASA standards and there's ESA, European Space Agency standards. And again, if you do a search online with Google, you'll find reference to these documents. You'll actually be able to download them because they are in the public domain. They are free of charge. Other suppliers in the industry do provide information in booklet form as well. So that's additional information which is available possibly to you. Now if you want a textbook on conformal coating, uh, this one was written by Manfred Super and it was, he is a, a supplier of conformal coating materials uh, in Germany 
And this book was translated about a year and a half ago, and it really is the most up-to-date text which is available on coatings, reliability, test methods, etc. So if you want a brand new book, then this really is the most up-to-date of books which is available in the industry. So let's talk about the process of coating before we talk about inspection and quality control. Now, fundamentally, there are four different coating methods, but um, the most popular methods we tend to see in industry are, first of all, dip coating. Now, we have a container full of coating material, depending on your specification, and we take our printed circuit board assembly and we slowly lower it in to the container with the coating in. This may be manual, it may be automated, it, or semi-automatic, it very much depends on your own facility and your requirements. And of course the size of the tank uh, will depend on board size, the material, throughput, and other issues. The important thing is controlling the material and also the solids content within the material, and also eliminating any contaminants that might be introduced by the printed circuit board or masking material that might be used on your printed circuit boards. So if we just uh, take a look, uh, in this example you can see uh, a video clip which shows a board going into a dip coater. You'll notice it's a bit jerky, this is as it's transmitted over the internet, it will always be slightly jerky, but uh, you can see the board enter and then when we've put it in place and it's been in the coating tank for a period of time, it will be removed and slowly drawn out. Now we have a hold time uh, in the coating to make sure that we're, the coating is penetrating where we want it to do and also to give a good even coating. Now the way in which or the speed that we draw the printed circuit board out of the uh, container of coating will very much depend, sorry, it will affect uh, the coating thickness, uh, it will affect the drainage from the printed circuit board, and if we don't control the coating material in the tank, then it will actually lead to build up and it will actually lead to coating spikes on some components. So it's, it's all about control of the material, but also the process. It's a very simple process, but the important thing here is we need to mask selected components, which we'll mention later on. We also have um, manual spraying, and the manual spraying can be conducted uh, using a can of spray in the simplest way, or we can use a spray gun. And in this example, an operator is manually spraying uh, one surface of the board, and he may go over it uh, again in another orientation, and what that does is overcome any of the shadowing that might be present on the printed circuit board. You'll also notice that um, this board assembly, as is all the ones on this pallet of boards, have been uh, protected by some form of tape. And this generally is the most expensive part of the process. So the coating is fairly inexpensive. It's the time to protect certain areas of the board. So if you're a designer online with this webinar, always think about trying to avoid things that need to be protected. Inevitably, connectors need to be protected, but sometimes you can actually use uh, connector hoods. Um, you can actually have plug-in connectors which protect the pins, and the coating can possibly be on the housing of the connector as long as it doesn't penetrate in or along the pin. So you've got to really think about design for manufacture when you're talking about coating to reduce uh, the operating costs. Again, another popular method which uh, is generally used in rework, but it's also used uh, on small quantities. Um, as you can see here, an operator is applying coating to the printed circuit board. Now you don't paint on coating, particularly solvent based systems, you really dob it on. And there is a variation of course on thickness, um, but if you try and paint it on to the surface, as the solvent evaporates during the painting stroke, it's just like trying to paint a fence or a door on a very hot day. I'm sure you know about that when you're doing your DIY at home. 
So that's a method and it's also probably the most common method uh, for reworking a product or after you've reworked a component on a printed circuit board. And then we move on to spray and spray application, whether it be a jet, a spray. Basically, we can program a machine to apply a coating continuously to one side of the printed circuit board, and then we would flip the board upside down and coat the opposite side of the printed circuit board. Or we would leave some areas on the board open which don't require coating. Again, we'll talk about areas that do and don't a little bit later. So just as an example, uh, this is a, a robotic system spraying the surface of printed circuit board. So we design a pattern, we spray the board or jet coat the board and leave selected areas free or we go back and put more coating on selected areas depending on what the requirement is for the particular printed circuit board. So those really are the most popular techniques within the industry and although one other coating process which is parallel um, is extremely popular in high-end electronics in medical electronics now parallel as a coating process is ba basically a process of uh, vacuum deposition um, we're actually applying putting a board assembly or board assemblies uh, into a chamber and it's a gaseous coating which forms on the surface of any exposed section of the board. So in this type of process, it is paramount that the type of protective mask or uh, masking boots to make sure the gaseous material can't condense on the surface. Otherwise, it will be coated. So if you have areas that mustn't be coated, it's very, very important to make sure uh, that you mask it effectively. Otherwise, it will be coated. Trust me. Now, Paralene is a coating. One of the disadvantages of the Paralene coating, although it's supremely accurate in terms of the thickness applied to a printed circuit board, it is difficult to see. Now, many of my friends say, no problem. You can inspect it. You can see it. I don't believe that's true, <laughs> and I've, I've inspected many boards. As the coating thickness builds, as it's much thicker, uh, possibly you can see it. Now, there are materials which have a UV trace in, and up until, I guess, in the last few years, Paralene did not have a UV trace, and I'll address that in a moment. But uh, what I show you here is two examples of well, a board and a joint, and at the bottom of the screen, you can see a parallel coating. And you can see it as a light gray coating literally going around the whole of the body, the black body of the component, and around the lead. And that's one of the beauties of this particular coating. It is more expensive as a process. However, the coating process is supremely accurate in terms of coating and coating thickness. And just to point those out, uh, you can see on the slide here where I've pointed arrows which show the coating on this micro section. Now just to show you that uh, some coatings, parallel coatings now have uh, a UV trace in, I've just shown the same printed circuit board with and without. And on the right hand side you can see I've used a UV light source to illuminate uh, the coating so you can actually see it in this example. So let's just consider in the coating process uh, or what are the processes which a board would go through. Now one of the question marks about conformal coating is do you need to clean? If you're a company who has done all the work necessary to prove that the fluxes you're using for hand soldering, wave soldering, selective and the fluxes from the solder paste meet the requirements for a no clean material which will not reactivate regardless of the temperature and humidity the board is exposed to, then absolutely you can conformally coat over it. The next issue that you need to address as engineers is to look at the adhesion characteristics. Is the adhesion on the printed circuit board affected by your no clean process? If you have a well controlled process then you shouldn't have an issue. However, some companies decide that it's uh, easier less hassle 
less opportunity for problems uh, to clean the printed circuit board. And I, I go by both. I use both processes. Um, so if you want an easy life, no issues, um, then by all means clean the printed circuit board. But you must get your cleaning chemistry compatible with the fluxes you're using. So many people uh, select a flux and then try and get a chemical to clean it off. You must pick the two together. Pick it as a package. Work with the supplier so you can get the whole package to work together. And this is particularly a problem for contract manufacturers where possibly the majority are using a no clean process and then a customer says, I want my products cleaned. Now, again, some companies do, some companies don't. So again, that's a lot of effort. So basically, if you step through this process, the basic the process won't change, but the clean or no clean argument is still there. And as I said, I've run clean processes and no clean processes with conformal coating very, very successfully. I'm not saying I always get it right. Uh, we can all have a little moment, but generally speaking, if you do your homework, do your testing, you shouldn't have a problem. Now, in terms of manual inspection, what I show you here is some typical examples of different joints and different components that have been coated. And some are under UV light uh, and uh, one is not under UV light. Um, and this gives you an example of what you might expect to see if you're examining printed circuit boards. Now, again, spray and dip coating are the most popular techniques but uh, I've mentioned the other two and you would generally find a variation depending on which technique you use and the thickness of the coating will also depend on the coating process used. Now if you change the material, you change the solids content um, within your dip material, you can adjust uh, the thickness based on the speed of entering into the dip coater, it coming out but the material itself uh, is one of the factors that you look at. Another example of some joints, and uh, on the top right view, I show you an example of a cap capacitor. Now, that board only had one component they wanted to coat. So that's why it's done manually. That's why it doesn't look as attractive, but uh, it fulfilled the purpose, it uh, changed and maintain the specification of that particular product. So again, sometimes you apply it to areas and sometimes you don't. If you look at bottom left, just as an example, there's a BGA. Now, with coating BGAs, if you dip coat it, you will fill or you'll partially fill underneath the package. And if you haven't done your homework right and you do temperature cycling, your product does temperature cycling, then the product might be affected because of that temperature cycling, it goes through. The coating can expand and contract. If you're doing spray coating, it's, I would say, virtually impossible to fill underneath the BGA. So spray coating over the surface and over BGA really isn't so much of a big issue. So just some typical examples of what we might expect to see on your product. Now, one of the more popular reasons, or one of the main reasons perhaps, why a lot of people have gone for conformal coating is because of the concerns of tin whiskers. And this is a reality, it's not something that's uh, put around to, to promote coating, it happens in the real world. And I've had failures in the real world which I've investigated for customers. Now, one of the nice things um, within the UK industry, and you can take advantage of this uh, information as well, is uh, I do work with the NPL, the National Physics Laboratory, and in my opinion, they've done a lot of work uh, on coatings and also whisker growth. And we have a technique which we can grow whiskers on demand. That allows us then to be able to test coatings and see how well uh, they protect. So unfortunately, um, if you just wait around and hope that a whisker is going to grow to see if your conformal coating works, you're going to be waiting around a long time. But if you can actually grow them on demand, you can then evaluate the coating and the coating thickness. So just a couple of examples I thought I'd include here. And you can visit um, the website and download all of the reports on coating. They're free of charge if you're interested. Uh, supported by our government, so that's kind of nice. Uh, so take advantage of it. 
So what I'm point, pointing out here is an SEM photograph of uh, some SOICs, and you can see I've pointed out the uncoated section on the side. Now sometimes, um, if you're doing spray coating, that is left uncoated, or the back of the pad, or the back of the lead. And we have seen whiskers grow from those areas. In fact, um, we've actually seen whiskers tend to find where there is an opening, i.e. where there is a defect sometimes in the coating. Now, you probably can't see the whisker. I'm just uh, pointing it out here. But uh, I've got another photograph which shows it uh, much more obvious. Now, again, a lot of people used to think that uh, whiskers were very small, a few microns. No, that's not the case. They can be millimeters or a number of millimeters long. So you're looking at this, and that is bridging between a 50-thou pitch IC. I don't need to say any more. So if you look at um, the website, defectdatabasempl.co.uk, you can download five or six different reports on this particular subject and looking at coatings, if that's something that might be of interest to you. Just a reminder that uh, if you want a copy of the presentation, um, then all you need to do is drop me an email, and the email address uh, I've sent you on a chat message for later on. Okay, so where do we coat? What do we coat? Well, first of all, you need to define that. You need to decide. And there are three things that I normally say when I'm working with a customer or working in contract. I say, tell me where you want to coat, where you don't want to coat, and where it doesn't matter. That gives more freedom um, for perhaps on a bad day having some coating which is sprayed for some reason in an area that doesn't really matter. Now, again, some quality engineers, remember I came from a quality background, um, might frown on me saying this, but those are, does it matter? If there's, a, if there's a small amount of coating on the top of a BGA, it doesn't matter. So you need to define those three things, where you want it, where you don't want it, and where it doesn't really matter from a rework and repair point of view. So if we take a typical printed circuit board, we would uh, not want to coat the edges, normally speaking, because the board may go into card runners, it might go into an assembly, uh, and putting a thick coating or a coating on the edges might affect that. Again, on your product it might not. If you've got open components like trimmers, uh, variable resistors, etc., then you may say, I don't want coating in those areas also. So providing a photograph, a drawing, something which is easily understandable, um, I say this for engineers, operators know what they're doing, but something that's easily understandable, you don't get confused. So it's nice and easy to say those three things. So in that example, perhaps I might say, okay, the key areas for me uh, are making sure these areas are coated, which I've highlighted on the slide now. So wh however you do it, whether it be drawing, a photograph, just really those are the sort of the three areas to consider. So we've got our printed circuit boards, we've coated them, um, we've got some sort of uh, reference. One of the other things I think is particularly useful, uh, particularly in contract, is to have a golden board, a sample of a board which is fully assembled, it's been coated, and that is your reference. And then there's no difference of opinion between quality, manufacturing, and the customer. You've got something which is golden board. You know what you want coated, where you want it coated, and also uh, areas, of, of, um, areas where you don't want uh, any coating to be present. Nice and simple, nice and easy. In terms of inspection, well, there's lots of different tools on the market. Um, simple inspection, microscopes, etc. I show an example of a mantis here, which is a popular technique in the industry, uh, which you can get um, retrofitted or you can fit yourself with a UV light. And on the right-hand side, you can see a UV torch. Um, I normally carry one in my pocket uh, when I'm working in uh, a coating area, just to look and see and check selected areas. Probably more to do with select checking where coating shouldn't be, i.e. in connectors, etc. 
but again, fairly inexpensive today. If you go onto eBay, um, not this particular one I show you, it's quite expensive, but there are some much cheaper ones available. And certain coating manufacturers offer these uh, torches uh, free to prospective customers. I'll leave it uh, to you to decide whether uh, that's one way of getting one for free. Now, all of the suppliers of AOI machines which are on the market, automatic optical inspection systems, basically now pretty much have the capability uh, to inspect, to a certain level, uh, coatings, coating presence, coating mist areas, etc. Uh, I show one, uh, this is a tabletop unit, but uh, there, nearly all of the suppliers will allow you to do that. And you'll find that, particularly in the automotive industry, uh, you know how customer or uh, purchase of automotive equipment tend to like automatic inspection. They want SPI, AOI, inline X-ray, so, so why not conformal coating as well? So that's one of the reasons why we have seen the introduction of automatic optical inspection. So here's just a couple of examples of screen grabs that I show you. They're fairly easy to program. Um, obviously, some machines are better than others. Again, if this is something that's of interest to you, then you can look at that. Now, I have actually used one of these machines in reverse. <laughs> it sounds a bit strange, but I thought I'd just uh, show you a couple of examples where I've actually taken a unit and used it as a cleaning evaluation tool. Now, this board I show you here is a solar paste test board, uh, which Indium Corporation use for certain applications. And as you can see, it's all fluorescing. All the solar paste residue is fluorescing. So basically what I was doing uh, two years ago was using this as an assessment tool, the machine as an assessment tool, to see about cleaning. And some of the areas you can see of the BGAs on the right-hand side, we had glass placed over the surface of the areas where there were dots of paste which had been reflowed, and we put it through a cleaner. Then we put it through AI to see whether the flux residue was removed effectively. Again, it's just another way of evaluating another part of the process, possibly with equipment you've already got, which is kind of neat. If you can use a piece of equipment for two or three tasks, that's got to be good news. Now, what I show you here is um, some process defects, you know, sort of quite common process defects that can occur. And we'll address these a little bit later on when we talk about uh, defects, but I just thought it was worth uh, showing you some uh, typical examples. Some are worse than others, and some are totally within your control. Again, the second example of page uh, of images, again, in your control. But again, if you've never experienced it before, never seen it on a printed circuit board, you possibly won't know why these defects occur. Occurred. Now, all of these are incorporated into a defect guide uh, that I wrote, a little uh, picture book guide. And again, if you're interested, um, when I send you a copy of the slides, if you request a copy, I'll send you a copy of that. So I think it's a 20-page uh, booklet as well. So again, it's free. Hopefully, it might be useful uh, to pass along to some of your colleagues. Now, most of you will be familiar with IPC as a standard uh, for conformal coating, and you'll see in the different editions um, reference to criteria and certain types of defect. But basically what we're trying to do, if you think about coating, we're trying to coat a surface, we're trying to have an even coating over that surface, there will always be a variation of thickness across the printed circuit board, you know, that's a given, uh, and there is a project running in the US right now where um, it's being coordinated by a number of companies looking at variation in thickness. And uh, my good friend uh, uh, Dave Hillman at Rockwell Collins uh, has done a couple of presentations on this subject, as has uh, his psychic, or perhaps his <laughs> perhaps psychic is the wrong word, but uh, uh, young Doug Pauls as well has done some very good uh, presentations on the subject. So. When we're looking at inspection, obviously you need to follow the criteria actually set, what class you're actually working to, and you also got to think about the thickness. And we'll talk about some of the simple ways we can look at thickness again during this webinar uh, this afternoon. 
Now, in addition to IPC, I mentioned NASA uh, have a document, and within it, there is a number of examples of what is acceptable and unacceptable for their criteria. There is reference to IPC in the NASA documents as well, um, but again, if you're working to NASA standards, then obviously that is the standard you must be working to. And there's a mixture of photographs, examples, uh, examples of different types of defects, which unfortunately are not covered in terms of why the defects occur, just briefly uh, saying that they are defects and unacceptable or acceptable. And there's a mixture also of illustrations, so it's not just photographs, um, there's also a mixture of illustrations as well. So you can find all of this online, literally just with a very simple Google search, and you can download the documents, which may hopefully assist you and your team uh, within your uh, quality department or in your coating department. So let's think of some of the simple things that we can do in terms of uh, coating and coating checking. Now, I've been criticized for some of my simple techniques, but I'd rather have somebody do something rather than nothing. And in a lot of organizations that I work in, uh, some people just do nothing. And it's much better to do something simple that gives some sort of feedback rather than the absolute accuracy that uh, some other companies insist on. So one of the simplest things is a wet film gauge, which has been in the industry for a long, long time. So basically with a wet film gauge, you spray a printed circuit board, you've obviously got a coating, and you apply the wet film gauge to an area, a waste area preferably, uh, on the printed circuit board. Now people would argue that really you want to know the thickness in every area, and yes, you can do that if you invest the time and effort. But if you consistently monitor one location, which is still representative of your spray pattern or your coating technique, then that's better than not doing anything at all. Now, wet film gauge basically um, is individual points set at different heights. So by applying that to the surface of the wet deposit and then lifting it off, as you see here, uh, we can see which areas touch the coating and which areas didn't touch the coating. And by comparing the thickness, then you've got an indication of the thickness, the wet thickness. Now remember that with a wet gauge, particularly on a solvent uh, coating system, um, the solvent evaporates, so the actual thickness of the finished coating, the coating after a curing, will be different. But we're looking at process control, so if we know that we've always got X, we can then determine what is Y going to be acceptable uh, after the curing process. Now some of these things are free, you can get them free from suppliers, some you have to pay for, very much depends on what you feel is appropriate for your particular company. Nice and simple. There are simpler techniques which I'll mention in a moment. Now one of the things again that a lot of people just do not cover, uh, I'd say to most people, you know, do you specify your solder mask? Well, yes, we do. We specify to IPC. We specify it to IPC 840. That's great. But every solder mask on the market will meet those specifications. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sold and used and specified. So if you're going to be buying boards from a supplier, you need to know what that coating is. You also need to know what the surface energy of that coating is. And also, if they change their material or specification, you need to know before those boards hit the floor. Because the surface energy of the coating may affect the material that you're applying. That's not to say it always will, but it can do. And a lot of people have suffered this problem. But remember that we take a printed circuit board also and run it through cleaning processes possibly, soldering processes, so you also <coughs> got to be able to check and see whether what you do to the printed circuit board affects the surface. So again, a way of doing that, and I'm not a great fan of uh, dyeing pens, but they do work to a degree. What I'm showing you in this video, a couple of videos here, is dyeing pens being used. And what it's doing is giving you an indication of the surface energy of the solder mask. 
and what you're looking at it it's de-wetting on the surface after it's been applied. Now each one of those pens has a different liquid in, so consequently when you check mask you'll be able to de uh, understand or you'll be able to uh, get a, an indication of the surface energy of that mask and also has it changed based on what you have done? So whether you, if you've cured it, you've heated it, you've baked it, or cleaned it, what effect have you had? So before blaming the mask manufacturer or your, uh, your uh, supplier, your PCB supplier, then you just need to see whether it's actually changed in your process also. So again, that's something you can buy. They're about 35 pounds, I was said $50, that sort of price. And they do last a fairly long time. You can do a sessile um, drop um, and a direct measurement of the wetting angles on a mask. And this is this is more like a shadow graph for engineers who remember the days when we used shadow graphs uh, um, in a mechanical environment. Basically, the same thing. We're taking a liquid with a known surface energy, and we're measuring the angle it forms on a coating. It's more accurate but the dime pens are easier to use. Now adhesion, now adhesion of a coating to a printed circuit board can be affected by no clean, it can be affected by washing, it can be affected by the mask. And you can measure uh, the, the effect on the surface of a board. And basically this is defined in the IPC standards where we score the surface of the mask and then we apply sticky tape to the surface and then peel uh, the sticky tape from the surface that we've scored. So in this example, this video clip, I'm just showing you scoring the surface and then we're going to put tape on the surface. Scripting is lifted from the surface of the mask. So on this particular case, no, which is great. But uh, again, it's, uh, a, it's quite a, uh, a test which is sort of quite demanding and you can buy these tools or you can do what I showed you previously, measure out the score lines, the number of score lines and use uh, a small blade to cut up. Perhaps not as consistent, but a lot cheaper than buying one of these tools. It's, it's your call. This is certainly easy to use, but uh, uh, my wife had, uh, was very worried when she saw the bill for one of these tools once. Now, if you're going to be doing and measuring coating materials that you're using in your application process, um, these are a method or are a method of checking the viscosity. So obviously understanding what the solids content of the material is in your spray reservoir or in your spray tank. Um, now these basically our cups, they've got a hole in the bottom as you can see from the photograph. So we dip these in, we lift them up, the material runs out the bottom and we time the period uh, for the material to continue and when it stops, so you can see an unskilled operator, me, uh, testing. So the video clip is just showing the material running out of the bottom and at some point it will break and start to break up at that point you stop the uh, watch. Now each of the coating suppliers will provide you with a graph so you can check the material you're using, the material you uh, uh, receive uh, within your tank or if you're mixing it yourself or thinning it out yourself, again you can do this. Um, so Zane Cups is a technique, uh, there are other techniques, this is pretty much the simplest technique that you can use. Now in terms of inspection and quality control, one of the things I always insist on is coating a sample board and I'm talking about a blank board. A lot of people want to jump straight in and coat a board that is assembled. Now in my opinion, you've got to make sure your program or your methodology of coating is working to start off with. There's no point in coating a board if the process isn't right. And if you coat a board, um, with lots of different different heights and different shapes of components on, you might be trying to solve a problem which has got nothing to do with the board, it's really the process, but it's masked because you've got components in the way. 
Now, equally, when you coat a board that's flat and it's perfect, and then you go on to the component version, um, then you might have problems. But you know, then at least you know the process is working properly. So, having some form of plate, uh, scrap board, or test card, I think, is you know fundamental. Now, Nordson realized this many, many years ago, and these test sheets have been around you know since I was a boy. And basically, you can see we're coating a sample card. It could be a board, but sample card. And it's programmed a certain length, a certain width, stop, start, possibly. You can make the program more complicated. But basically, what it's doing is looking at the coating and its coating consistency. And you can obviously add in here your parameters, the type of material you're using, pressures, hold time, speed, all those sort of parameters, and then look at the coating. So in these examples, these are, these are wonderful. There's no spitting, there's no overspray. Um, as soon as it stops, um, or the program stops, it, it's cutting. Wonderful. Now, if every, every system was set up and working like this, we'd all be out of a job. But seriously, um, this is what you start off with. So after every maintenance, reset up, first set up before you start running your process, let's make sure the process is running first. Now in terms of dry measurement um, of coating, so when you've cured the coating, when you've dried the coating, etc., by whatever method you're going to be using, um, then you will be interested in the thickness of the coating. Now there's a couple of different ways. Uh, we can measure the coating directly um, using eddy current. However, you need to do this on a multi-layer board. It has to be a board which has got metal underneath the coating. Um, if it's a, a double-sided board and there's not a lot of uh, metal underneath it, then you're going to get some erratic readings. But uh, if you do it on a, a sample, and most people are, are running multi-layer boards today, so you get some fairly repeatable readings. But what I'm illustrating here is a simple gauge, and we've got calibration strips and you can see miraculously uh, when I actually measure a calibration strip, um, it says 54 microns and it's 54 microns on the gauge. Generally speaking, it's not quite like that, but uh, obviously this was a good day. Um, but it's fairly repeatable and very accurate, but obviously that's dependent on where you're measuring on the board. So in terms of quality control, you might say, okay, we're gonna measure two positions on a board, but you must measure the same positions to have repeatability of measurement, but that will also show the variation in your process. So just think about how you're going to do it um, and build up the stats or the information from doing it in a consistent way. Now another wet method you can use, and again, there's been two or three people who have criticized me on this. They say it's, it's not accurate enough. It's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit, it, well, it's not good. <laughs> However, this is better than nothing at all. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm just putting some sticky labels on the surface of printed circuit board. I coat them, I cure them, and I can peel them off. I can measure the difference in coating thickness between the label and the coating I've added to it, or I could measure the height of the coating on the board, so the variation of the coating to where I've masked it. Um, and you can use that, you can use a, a digital micrometer um, with a depth gauge, you know, a, dim, uh, uh, a direct measurement, um, just like the dam busters method of measuring solder paste we used to use in the, in the old days. So there are simple techniques that we can do. As long as you do it consistently, you're going to get some value out of doing those measurements. In addition, uh, you can save these labels as your quality control. Um, example, if you like. Uh, in the industry, particularly for uh, some military contracts, they want you to have a reference board from a batch, or a test plate, or a test bare board. That's fine. It just depends on the company and uh, what uh, budget you've actually got. Another alternative is doing a direct measurement, and this is using a spectrometer. So again, you're measuring directly the coating from a sample that you've put into the system. Now, the nice thing about um, 
doing direct measurement um, with uh, Parallene coating is you can get a very accurate measurement, but as I've already said, Parallene is extremely accurate to start off with, so generally speaking, um, it shouldn't be too much of an issue to you. Now you can do microsections as well, and really you'd only ever do microsections as an initial setup. So you set your process up for a particular product, you get your parameters right, and this microsection, I apologize, it's a bit scratched, it's not one of my better ones, but it shows clearly the conformal coating, parallel coating over this uh, uh, termination, and you can actually see the uh, flux residues as well, which, where it was no clean. Um, so that's the brown gunk that you can see underneath the coating, as I indicate here. So again, I've done this on boards which are 10, 15, and 30 microns, and again, you can get fairly good repeatability in measurement if you do the microsection, but it's much more difficult for other coatings. So if we look at the other examples here, um, yes, I've done microsectioning, um, but the coating itself will vary in thickness across the surface of the component because of the shape of the component. So when you've got nice square things, or rounded things, or sharp things, the sharp things, the coating tends to be uh, much thinner. So you will always see variation across different surfaces. And if there is a particular component which is very, very sensitive that you need to coat, or some area which is very susceptible to uh, moisture and corrosion, then you possibly have to coat it twice. It very much depends on your product. You know your product. Uh, better than I. Now, in terms of um, contamination, um, any printed circuit board can have contamination on the surface. Uh, these are a couple of very simple examples, obviously. Um, at least we would be able to identify the person who handled the board on the left-hand side. There's a beautiful thumbprint. Um, on the right-hand side, we see a fibre, probably from a bristle brush. Um, which has been used either to coat or to clean the printed circuit board. So, I mean, these are, you know, those ones are pretty obvious. But if you have coated a board and haven't cured it, or are waiting for uh, the dry, initial dry off um, or the solvent to evaporate, you've got to try and make sure that <coughs> no contamination will be present or come into contact with the printed circuit board. That's uh, paramount. Now, if we're going to dry, or we're going to hold the boards for a period of time uh, for flash off to occur, this is the evaporation of the solvent from solvent based systems, then rather than leaving them lying around, I personally think it's better to put them in a box, in a glass cabinet. We're not necessarily um, evaporating the material or forcing the evaporation because that can lead to, to other issues, but it makes sure the boards are not going to get contamination dropped on them. So that's why I suggest that uh, having some form of protection from the boards, if you're working in a cleaner environment, a cleanish environment, or you're storing the boards in a clean environment, that's fine. But control the environment so you don't get surface contamination. There's nothing worse than having to rework a board which has got a few hairs or little marks on. Um, it may not affect the product at all, but certainly uh, it's time consuming to rework. Now, if you are running a coating material or a coating process um, where you're going to be having to force the uh, cure cycle, um, then you should check the profile. So some coatings you have to profile, but also when we're talking about UV materials, um, you need to think about curing as well. And the reason being that with a UV system, although you're using UV light to cure the material, in an inline system, uh, heat can be generated by the lamps which you're using to cure the material. So if you've got components which are tall components, very close uh, to the lamps, then they may be affected or the coating on them may be affected. Not because um, there's a compatibility, it's just purely the temperature. So you should know. So you would do a profile, and I just show an example here, just like you do for normal reflow soldering. So most engineers are very familiar with this. Again, this would be recommended by the manufacturer uh, on what is necessary. 
and to quote my good friends um, again at Rockwell Collins, everything works fine in a process until somebody decides to change it. So if a process is running correctly, then don't change it. That's a nice simple way, a simple way for an engineer certainly. But seriously, you know, every time people try to force it, get it done two seconds faster or t two minutes faster, that's when problems occur. So as an example, what I've tried to show you here um, is the impact of void formation when you're trying to quickly cure uh, a coating. And you can see some beautiful examples. I click through the photographs as they pop up on the slide here uh, of voids uh, within the coating. So this can be voids from the coating as the solvent is evaporating. It can be air pockets trapped underneath the part. It can be a number of other reasons, but just a nice example. And for those of you who have never seen void formation and disappearing or, bu or bubble formation, uh, these are two video clips that I made um, for a presentation and just to show you what's actually happening. So here we've got uh, some bubbles in the coating. Now, if you have a long hold time to allow the solvent to evaporate and the bubbles to escape, then you are less likely to have bubbles left in the coating. If you speed up things, if you cure it quickly or you dry it quickly, it's less likely to come out. So it's a combination of not necessarily air trapped in the, in the surface or in the coating or underneath the coating. It's also the way in which we handle the boards afterwards. Also, there's other factors, but I just thought uh, that uh, producing these couple of video clips just shows you uh, what can happen if you just hold on, wait a little bit of time, and uh, the bubbles will disappear. And then we don't have to have a debate on uh, what's an acceptable bubble and what's not an acceptable bubble. Now I mentioned about uh, UV cure, sorry, UV uh, curing, and just an example of boards, or some of my test boards going through UV cure. Um, but remember what I said, try and do a profile. So this example is a board, you've got some components on, which are obviously closer to the UV uh, source. Um, so again, are they at a different temperature to the rest of the printed circuit board? In addition, if again you're using uh, UV, then you should check the degree of cure, i.e. the curing process that's being applied. The reason being that UV lamps change over time. Anybody who knows anything about printed circuit board manufacture, uh, imaging and curing of solder resist knows that you have to check uh, to make sure that the proper cure is being applied, obviously, and one of the ways of that is checking how um, the cure changes based on uh, the amount of exposure to UV source or UV light. Now, as I said, uh, earlier that where you've got uh, sample boards, that's great, where you've got control of thicknesses, but on some US contracts and some MOD contracts, uh, a witness sample is required, so a sample that actually goes with a batch. I think that's quite expensive to do, I think there are better ways of doing it. It very much depends on what you have to do within your own environment. Now, halfway through the presentation, I mentioned um, a defect guide uh, for conformal coating and cleaning uh, that I produced. I produced this uh, for the Smart Group or for a Smart Group event uh, some time back. But again, for anybody who wants a copy, along with the slides, just drop me an email and I'll send you a copy of that for uh, your future reference. A couple of other books that I've written uh, in the last uh, couple of years, not related to conformal coating, but again, maybe of interest to you, Again, they're available free as a download. There's my book on package on package assembly, inspection, and quality control. So it's package on package, BGA on top of BGA, basically. Or there's my book on uh, through hole reflow or intrusive reflow or pin in paste reflow. Again, both of those books are about 100, 120 pages. Uh, some people say, well, how could you write a book which is 120 pages on pin in paste? Trust me, there's a lot more to it than actually meets the eye. And in addition, uh, if you uh, are members of IPC or SMTA, um, they sell some of my products 
uh, on conformal coating as well. So again, that might be of interest uh, to you if you're interested in the subject. Okay, so what I've tried to do in this presentation is briefly talk about uh, some of the issues of conformal coating, some of the quality control uh, aspects of conformal coating, and also some of the simple things you can do from a quality control point of view. I've already said that if you want to copy of the presentation, drop me an email and the defect guide, um, then that's available to you. Now, I don't know what Alex has got planned uh, with regard to Q&A and questions. Uh, I'll let uh, Alex jump in and tell us what he has planned. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I will un unmute your mics here. So if you have any questions for Bob, uh, feel free to uh, ask them. It would appear, it would appear, Alec, that uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. If anybody's got a question, they can just drop me an email when they request a copy of the presentation. So I think that that's probably the better way of doing it. Is that all right with you, Alec? That works, Bob. Um, I also want to mention that we will be posting this webinar uh, on our YouTube channel, and uh, I will send um, you all that link as well uh, within the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. <laughs>